The core of the Earth is 6,000 degrees Celsius, the same temperature as the surface of the Sun. Anywhere in the world, if you drill deep enough, you reach temperatures far beyond what we need to produce baseload clean energy. To quickly scale geothermal development globally, we need a detailed understanding of how deep the heat is and what rock types exist in areas of interest. Having reliable, high-resolution maps of global temperature at depth, particularly within a few hundred miles of the world's population centers, would be an invaluable asset, decreasing project development risk and increasing the likelihood of funding. So, what collaborations can we build to produce maps showing global temperature at depth? What technologies and methodologies can we bring to bear from the oil and gas industry to produce these maps? And can oil and gas data reveal where in the world geothermal's low-hanging fruit lies? Let's explore. Hi folks, my name is Mike Eros. I'm your moderator for today's Meeting of the Minds. I have a really enjoyed getting to know our panel today um, and collectively they represent more than about a century of knowledge and experience. And we're gonna have a great conversation about 45 minutes with some questions and answers from you guys. I just wanted to introduce a little bit of uh, why I'm here. This is my second Pivot 2020-2021 conference. And um, what we did last year during the pandemic was really an amazing experience really galvanized in me the desire to join the geo ex geothermal exploration and development projects that are going on globally during this global energy transition. And I'm really inspired by our panelists today who are taking on some of these toughest challenges that we face as an industry. And today specifically, we're gonna talk about the groundwork around data that's required for this effort. And our folks in general bring a lot of interesting perspectives to bear on that from multiple, multiple perspectives. So my personal background, I'm interested in this from a geochemical perspective, having worked on clay mineralogy and paleo temperature work, and more recently professionally to help build integrated subsurface geological reservoir models uh, to profitably develop high pressure and high temperature supercritical reservoirs for CO2 injection onshore, as well as deep water brine injection. And uh, our, our panelists have a, a wider range of diverse expertise as you'll see. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce them, um, starting with Isabel Chambafort. Take it away. Hi. Good, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm not sure in which part of the world you, you all are joining in. Uh, so my name is Isabel Chambafort. I am a senior scientist at GNS Science in New Zealand. I am the program leader of Geothermal The Next Generation, who is looking for exploring the supercritical resources of New Zealand particularly in the Topo Volcanic Zone. Um, I am also um, leading some <clears throat> work in emission and the gassing of natural geothermal system in volcanic area, as well as looking at some high temperature research for governmental funded from New Zealand. So high temperature geothermal, uh, that is me. Great, let's go to Ellie next. Hi everyone, uh, I'm really excited to be on this panel, so thanks for the invitation. So my name is Ellie McInnes, I'm the head of CTG Geothermal Science, and prior to this role I worked uh, mostly in um, international new ventures and global exploration in a number of different oil companies, and I'm especially excited to be uh, taking part in Pivot because last year really kind of marked the start of my journey into geothermal. And, and for me, and also for the industry, it's been a really rapid learning, um, just the, the advancements and the level of excitement and, and the types of clients that we're speaking to, um, you know, they're people from all parts of the industry are starting to get interested. So to me, that, that's really positive. As a company, uh, CTG have been involved in geothermal for almost uh, 18, 19 years. We've done over 130 projects globally. Most of these projects have been in the high enthalpy traditional geothermal areas. My role and, and my team, we, we're really looking to expand geothermal um, beyond these well-developed areas. Our main focus is sedimentary basins, but, but we have a, an interest in all geological settings. And we bring together 
our deep subsurface understanding, along with huge vast data sets that we've gathered together from oil and gas and mining, public sources, uh, water chemistry. And it's, it's one of the main things that I'm excited about is this collaboration between all the different groups, uh, universities and, and corporate and governments. And by sharing all these different data types, we can really make progress quite quickly. So thanks again. Great. Ken, you want to, you're allowed to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Ken Weijin. I'm a geothermal geophysicist and associate director of the Bureau of Economic Geology here at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, it's an honor to be on the panel today with uh, fellow panelists and to the audience from around the world. My current research projects here involve a assessment, a whole state assessment of the geothermal resources in Texas with an eye towards the new geothermal anywhere paradigm, as well as an Air Force funded project uh, looking at putting in a geothermal power plant on the south side of Houston at a small base called Ellington Field. Elsewhere at the university and the bureau and such, we have people that are involved with the forge project as well as the Cornell direct use project. And in the petroleum engineering uh, department in particular, uh, several endowed senior uh, chair professors are working on uh, or leading projects in new techniques in geothermal drilling. Thank you. Fantastic. How about you, Silvio? Uh, thank you, Mike. So, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, I am I am Silvio Livescu, the pressure pumping chief scientist at Baker Hughes, and also the data science and engineering analytics technical director on the Society of Petroleum Engineers International Board. Um, my interests are related to well construction and production engineering and uh, uh, well and reservoir monitoring, downhole telemetry, and of course, uh, data science and uh, artificial intelligence applied to hydrocarbons production and, and uh, geothermal now. Uh, and just like everybody else, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here today. I'm honored to be with uh, the other panelists uh, talking about uh, reservoir characterization. And uh, um, just like Ellie, uh, my, my journey in geothermal uh, really you know, uh, kicked up uh, last year after after Pivot 2020. So um, I'm, I'm more than happy to be here. Thank you. Well, fantastic. I thought maybe, uh, General Weijin, we start with you. You know, the Bureau of Economic Geology that you work with has extensive access to oil and gas data in particular. And I'm curious how you envision using this and other <clears throat> to produce these high resolution products, lithology maps at scale, various things like that. Okay, yes, um, we have a long uh, history of working closely with industry and have access to a uh, large amounts of data. Uh, we have here, as do others around the world, uh, a massive uh, library of well logs and cores. And personally, I think uh, that's very ripe ground and low hanging fruit for machine learning applications, particularly when you're talking about primary data, which is temperature, for geothermal, and you're looking at what is a very noisy uh, data set like bottom hole temperatures, which still don't have all that sophisticated correction methods to them. I think incorporating a big data analysis using machine learning really has a lot of potential to improve the quality of our data. Similarly, an even uh, less well exploited resource would be the core, li core libraries where one of your primary uh, or main secondary data points are thermal conductivities, which are essential, but are fairly rare as far as being well-determined. And there are various methods for uh, determining those uh, with a formula. But again, I think that's another area that's ripe uh, for machine learning applications. Fantastic. Yeah, and for our audience too, if you have questions that you'd like to share, please go ahead and, and uh, we'll work to filter those in as we can. And I'm gonna continue to, to try to let everybody have some time uh, with our panelists. So Isabel, your research has included a lot of detailed subsurface modeling, integrating a, a pretty wide variety of, of data to characterize these thermal fields, including the supercritical domain. I'm curious, 
what novel low cost approaches to data gathering or really any approaches to interpretation are exciting you these days as we improve our ability to understand and develop? Yeah, as you said, like, I mean, it's to understand a geotermal system, particularly in the field beyond the known conventional, like for that's what I'm looking, right? This has been quite challenging. Um, and that's where coupling all those data set for us with um, modeling has actually been really, really important. And we didn't go into traditional modeling because we are going beyond the, well, beyond the supercritical, right? So supercritical for water. Um, so you need some sort of serious um, equation of state to sustain some of this modeling. Um, so we, we, we gathered with some, particularly for our program, we're looking with some people that have developed some code originally associated with in mining. So we're bringing some of its their knowledge that they associate with um, some, some experience in Iceland, particularly. And we are uh, merging into, or we are trying to merge some of their our um, large seismic, uh, magnetotelluric, uh, magnetic gravity, geochemistry data set into, into some of them to constrain some of their modeling. To be able to do that, though, you still need to have a very good understanding of what, what is the phasing of your crust, I will say. And so seismic and or in geophysics in, in general is the, the go-to method. One of the things that, that excite me right now is to try, well, there's all this application, obviously in AI that, we, we, that we're just starting, I think, um, touching in geothermal, that's gonna be a tremendous change, I think. Um, but integrating data um, is, is really something that what, what we haven't been able to capture very well in geothermal and conventional, it's how to actually merge um, at the reservoir scale once we know more or less where you can be linking the chemistry of what's happening at the surface, or if you have some well down with some actually proper geophysical modeling. And it's not something that is necessarily easy to merge because those are very different data sets. So we're trying to figure out the option of how we can try to model sort of this chemical reaction. So that is a very exciting thing um, for, for, for me, for sure. But the, the need for an integrated data sets when you're working in an tumor system, um, it, it, it's a must because they are geological objects that are not made of one 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 things if you want so we need all the cooperation and all the discipline um and and of course the more we we have an integrative data the more you can constrain any um, machine learning in the background as well so um yeah that's that's one of the things that excites me merging data sets for sure low low cost obviously modeling it's a lot of power uh, brain power costs um and you just need like super you know super computers but um to run some of the model one thing as well that i could add is that we have been trying really to advance um is I mean, not not me i must admit that's my some of my colleagues because it's beyond my skill is actually refining some of the geophysical coding to down but, but they, they are, they're doing an amazing job and there's so much innovation in geophysics right now, but what we need is really to pass from a regional, um, regional scale geophysics to actually having something that is target scale, where you can target your drilling more efficiently. And when you are beyond the conventional in field where you don't have drilling or you, yeah, or you're at greater depths, you do not have that resolution. So improving the, the resolution has been really um, something we are looking carefully. Fantastic. There's a lot to unpack there too. And I, I appreciate the comments you're making that echo what Ken's saying too, around machine learning, et cetera. I, I'd like to pivot now to Ellie um, and Sylvia, I guess both of you. You know, Ellie at CGG, you sit at the helm of some of the largest efforts globally to integrate geothermal data and, and Sylvia at Baker Hughes and working with the Society of Petroleum Engineers, you tackled some of just the hugest issues describing this rapid, uh, rapidly developing field and, and also reservoir scale technology applications. How do you both see this developing landscape of data and, and maybe how has it changed in the last decade? And I'll start with you, Ellie. 
Uh, thanks, Mike. So, so first of all, um, when, when my team and I think about geothermal data, we, we take a really wide definition. And, and the reason we do that is to help us to understand um, not just the subsurface characterization, but also the opportunities, the commercial opportunities. Um, and I, th I think for geothermal, you know, at the end of the day, we need it to have um, commercial opportunities. So when we talk about the subsurface data, and this ties in with Ken and Isabel's comments, you know, we're really focused on understanding and characterizing uh, the geological setting. We need to understand the tectonic regime. We need to have a really good handle on heat flow. And, and as discussed, um, temperature at depth measurements are very complex and trying to really um, QC and collate and understand where that data has come from and how reliable it is, is a massive task. And we're, we're talking global data sets here. The other thing that my team's currently really interested in is understanding the, the shallower section, what the temperature profiles are in the, the shallower sections. And that's sometimes difficult because the oil and gas, you know, we, we drill through those sections and we're, we're looking at the deeper sections to get to our targets. So um, understanding that that shallow section and the mineralogy and the lithology, is it acting as, as a conductor or an insulator? You know, we, we have to think about all these things when we build our um, temperature models. The other thing is really important is flow rates, just like in oil and gas, what sort of permeability, uh, which fractures are open, which are closed, what kind of permeability do we have? Um, and again, porosity, water chemistry, fluid chemistry. So, so when we talk subsurface data, that that's kind of encompasses the, the main parts. And then from this, we think about the, the above ground. So for example, what's the local infrastructure? Um, where are the local population centers? Uh, what's uh, you know agricultural energy needs? Uh, what's the grid system like? Are we looking for a base load um, power or high temperature opportunities to go into the grid, or are we looking at lower medium temperature that we can um, you know use for cascading use to the local markets? So it's kind of quite different from oil and gas where you have a product and you ship it and that's fine. With geothermal, um, there's a lot of different variables and trying to work out what is the best um, end use for, for the opportunities that we identify. Um, and then another, another thing that we're really interested in, in is what, what does our, our fluid chemistry data tell us about potential for critical mineral production um, and that, that's something I know there's a, a session on later in the week, but that can be a commercial game changer for clients. So, so trying to not just think about the subsurface, but think about where the opportunities lie, what kind of portfolio can we build? Okay. It sounds like you're, you're getting into a lot of really interesting data sets there. And maybe we can touch on that, some of those again. How about you, Sylvia? Yeah, thanks, Mike. So, wow, uh, great comments from, from Ken, Isabel, and, and Ellie. Um, so, um, I, I agree with everything said, and, and, and um, I, I want to add a few, a few things here. Um, well, first of all, let me start by talking just, you know, one minute about Baker Hughes and what we are doing. So, um, I'm sure many people know, uh, and, and for those who don't know, uh, Baker Hughes is one of the largest loyalty services companies with operations in more than 120 countries around the world. Um, and now we are a global energy technology company. Um, so we have extensive experience in related to reservoir characterization in most, if not all, um, hydrocarbon fields around the world. Um, and, and now we are extending that, that you know, experience, diversify experience uh, to geothermal applications. And we are talking here about, uh, as I said, formation, subsurface characterization, and, and all our operations related to drilling, to production, um, and so on. Uh, so on. Um, now, um, talking about data, um, I, I would like to start with data acquisition. Um, and so, and so, you know, for for us in the oil field, actually, one of the biggest challenge we have is to to acquire the data and to acquire good data, not not just any data. And so, um, I I believe that there are huge opportunities for micro seismic monitoring, like mentioned before, um, and, and more efficient drilling and wallboard placement for uh, to mitigate 
project risk and, and reduce costs. Um, this, again, was mentioned before, um, but also artificial intelligence related um, uh, reservoir monitoring for field and power plant uh, optimization. And, and when I say that, um, I am really looking at, at all sides of, of what it means actually to produce energy from a geothermal resource. Um, so just like Eddie said, um, you know, we are producing oil and gas from many, many kinds of reservoirs. And I think one solution is not going to feed a geothermal resources, uh, resource as well. Um, so we need to look for, first for the low hanging fruits. And also we need to, um, to see where the value is. Right, um, but but in order for us to get to that value, we need to collaborate, and only diversify experience, I think, can get us there um, as soon as possible. So um, the research and technology de uh, deployment, um, from my point of view, are, are going to be around high temperature telemetry, um, the sensors and electronics, and 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 so right now the electronics have. Um, a, a temperature limit because of the oil and gas applications. Um, we need to increase that for geothermal applications and software, um, mathematical modeling, numerical modeling, everything related to data science and, and artificial intelligence. Um, now, related to your question, uh, Mike, um, about the, uh, the technology applications in the last decade, um, I, um, I can say I have been deeply involved with um, well intervention telemetry for oil and gas uh, applications. And uh, um, again, I, I, I can say that in the last 10 years, we started to use downhole telemetry for well intervention operations for oil and gas. Um, and, and both systems consist of, um, of downhole sensors and optical fibers, and of course the software for visualizing the data, interpreting the data, uh, analyzing the data, all that. And, 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 and the goal is really to improve, to, to increase the production at the lower cost. Um, so the initial reaction of, of some operators um, back back 10 years ago or so uh, was that both systems uh, increased the operational cost compared to conventional well interventions without telemetry systems. Um, and it took our industry, the oil and gas industry, several years to see how much value both systems bring um, in terms of risk mitigation, increased operational efficiency and shorter uh, operational times, um, cost reduction, operational cost reduction, um, and overall increased production post, uh, post intervention. Um, I, I, I think we are now at the same tipping point for geothermal applications. So downhole telemetry systems for data acquisition and artificial intelligence related reservoir monitoring technologies are tremendous opportunities for geothermal. Um, but now um, talking about collaboration and, and, and you know, temperature maps and how we can use the data to, um, to come up with, uh, with uh, temperature maps and, uh, and basin maps. Um, I, I want to give an example uh, from SPE, Society of Petroleum Engineers. And, and let me put my, my SPE hat now. Um, and, and I want to talk, um, uh, for, for a couple of minutes about a recent data tone um, organized by two of the largest SP sections, uh, Calgary and the Gulf Coast in, um, in, in Houston, and Untapped Energy, a nonprofit data science and analytics uh, organization from uh, Calgary. Um, this is an outstanding collaboration example of where we should head uh, to as a, as a global geothermal community. So, the organizing committee of more than 20 very dedicated volunteers uh, spent more than six months planning this event with weekly meetings and so. Um, and, and, and the data tone was attended by more than 240 very passionate data scientists and, and oil and gas professionals from um, at least 14 countries around the world. Um, the objective was to use data from more than 800 wells from Alberta in Canada and, and Texas in the United States um, for estimating the formation temperatures, creating two basin temperature models, and evaluating the geothermal potential of both two basins by either converting existing oil and gas wells uh, or drilling new wells. Um, I, 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 I encourage everyone um, 
interested in this data ton to visit the website, uh, just just Google uh, Geothermal Experience 2021 uh, SPE, um, and, and you'll find it. You can register for free to watch the videos uh, of the competition and data bootcamps. So the event took uh, two months. Um, you had you know, everything uh, uh, about geothermal energy training, about data uh, science uh, training, and, and so on, and the competition itself. Um, I'm sure that you will be surprised by everything you'll find uh, um, and learn uh, there. But, but one last thing I want to mention now is that based on, on, on the tremendous success of this data tone in North America, uh, later this year, uh, we are going to have another one uh, in Europe this time, organized by four European SP sections, one in London, uh, the Netherlands, the Italy, and, and Bucharest. And, and so um, I know they are still discussing about the scope um, of this competition. However, they are looking also at the um, economics of a geothermal project. So um, this is all very new for all of us, uh, but the potential for using data for geothermal applications is obvious. And, and this data tone is it, it's a, a very clear example of what we can do with data. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. I, I'm going to go to Ken in a minute to talk about uh, maybe some of the regional data he might suggest or or think about uh, for greenfield ge geothermal development. But I wanted to touch a little bit on what you're saying, Sylvia, about the collaboration space that you've seen and also some of the applications from oil and gas that may have been you know successful in the last you know decade or so. And that's something I'd, I'd open to everybody if you had other thoughts about, because in my mind, it's especially timely, and you know the, the downhole telemetry data you're talking about in particular, the, the rise of DOS, and the remote sensing applications we have in general and well borers, is a really interesting new burgeoning frontier. Um, and so, yeah, if, if there's if there's things that you guys would like to touch on, please interrupt me about the uh, the benefits of oil and gas learning that we've applied. But also, Ken, I, I wanted to be sure I, I touch base with you again on the data side. You know, as we're talking about. Uh, regional data in particular, if there's, you mentioned a few of the data sets that you find interesting. I'm curious, in general, how we're getting access to this data and, and whether these efforts are yielding new fruit or, or seeing new access potentially. I know that open access is a question as well for a lot of folks, and that's kind of the elephant in the room for all of us uh, is around access. So there's a lot, Hi. but pick up where you'd like to. Okay, well, yes, there is a lot there. Um, the access is improving. Uh, there's already good re uh, reservoirs of data of a national system here in the US and others around the world. Uh, there's definitely a, a need to standardize those and on just simple things like formatting and then integrating up to larger scale, a whole worldwide scale at as much resolution as we can get. There is, as you're kind of touching on, a lot of data sitting in industrial libraries. And that takes relationships to get access to. On the oil and gas side, we have done that uh, on a fairly regular basis uh, here at the Bureau. You can protect it in different ways. You can anonymize it in different ways if that's necessary, but you just gotta keep plugging away. And I think the both the professional societies and the industry associations can be a good conduit there in essentially what is trust building. Uh, but obviously the more data you can get, the better, uh, you know, more, more that the machine learning can learn on and such. Uh, at the same time, when you're talking about the mapping and such, there are very good maps out there on a regional and larger scale national scale, but there's a lot of people coming into geothermal now as exemplified by this conference. A lot of the interest focused on the engineering side that may not appreciate the uncertainties and the subjectivities on the earth science side. And that's one of those things that, that concerns me. You can get a false sense of confidence from looking at the maps. They're aggregating the data without and it takes a lot of digging to, to get into what are the uncertainties involved, especially like if you're using BHT data, uh, what are the judgment calls? You know, there's extreme heterogeneities in data spacing, in data quality and such. 
that all evaporates when you're looking at these nice multicolored maps. And especially if you compare them side by side, you can see some real differences in subjective uh, work behind the scenes. But uh, back to the, the raw data, there's a lot of data. We've just got to keep plugging away. People here on the other, other people here on the uh, panel and other panels that are on the other side of the industry academic uh, equation might want to chime in on what can we do uh, to get some of that data out. Thank you. So if it's okay, I'll, I'll come in now. Um, the the data side is clearly something uh, very important to, to CGG and, and it's really one of our foundations. Uh, a way that, that we're quite familiar with um, from, from the commercial and, and industry side of things is the multi-client model. So, you know, having a group of operators who have shared goals, shared interests, uh, common thinking to come together and, and share their data, share their le learnings. Okay, you lose a bit of that exclusivity, which, um, you know, can, can be handled in different ways, but you can have a much broader scope, both geologically, technically, and, and geographically by coming together, sharing that data, sharing your knowledge, and then, then you can really make decisions as an industry of what are the best places to explore and, and you know, how do we commercialize this on a bigger scale and how do we share our, our resources to get further ahead? So I think, I think for me that that's a natural one is, is the multi-client side of things. Can I just jump in here, Mike? I please, just wanted please. to... Yeah, no, I just wanted to continue. Um, I fully agree with Heli again, what we were, we're talking about, but I just want to, to jump in on the resolution that um, Ken was mentioning. And I think one of the things we need to move on, um, and I, I'm going to take a peek at the geophysicist here, but <laughs> it's, instead of having exactly, but there is such a wide range of interpretation in geophysical models that come behind it, that we need to move into almost like a probability geophysical map, where you actually have, if you can have a number, um, for example, probability of hitting permeability, probability, that is a, the value that can be feed into risk model for financial investment as well. And it's really important when you're trying to um, gather some, you know, um, obviously to gather some interest and gather some, some, some or limit your risk for exploration. Um, so the, the, the need of, and that, that's what this need of increasing resolution, but as well increasing the, our understanding of um, uncertainty around the data set is really um, important for, for not only for, you know, for ge geologists that we always want, you know, more, more detail, but um, I think for, for us is to link with what Ellie was saying is how we can convey and, and convince um, multi-clients that I said will be into resolving, lowering some of the risk that they have in investment, because at the end of the day, that's what will make, will make them jump into exploration. So um, yeah, I just wanted to jump in on that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and your experience uh, working with multi, multi-client stakeholders really is, is is also on my mind, you know, I, you've seen it from the, from the ground up and what it can take to bring folks to the table. Mm -hmm. Mike, can I jump in as well? Please. Yeah, so, so um, excellent. So um, two comments I, I have to make here. So, so first of all, you know, the oil industry have been around, has been around for, for so much longer and, and is so much bigger currently than, than the geothermal industry, right? So um, our business models around data and, and you know, everything we are doing with data um, are, are fragmented and are proprietary and, and we are very sensitive about IT issues and, and you know, um, companies, uh, you know, make money from, from the data, right? Um, and, and, and I think we don't necessarily need to emulate that to geothermal to scale it up because actually that will take again a long time and we are going to, you know, make mistakes and learn from them and, you know, just learn as we go. Um, but we don't have time really for that uh, as well. We cannot wait for decades for geothermal to, you know, become really a, um, a global um, industry um, everywhere, right? Uh, 
so so that's the first comment I want to make. The second comment I want to make is um, is related to what Ken said. Probably instead of having you know companies to lead an effort for collaboration and and and, and unified data, um, we have the prof professional societies. We have you know non uh, we have the government agencies. And and I have an example actually uh, for um, from um, Open Subsurface Data Universe OSDU that is trying actually to unify under one umbrella all data related to oil and gas and now to solar and wind so they are uh, jumping into renewable as well. So um, within SP we try to attract them uh, to give us more and more presentations about what they they are doing and how they are doing. But probably that's something that we need to uh, add. I'm not saying they should do it, but something like that we should look at to find out ways to um, um, to, to unify our data. Uh, oh, and one more comment um, I would like to make. And, and so the last thing is that the data by itself is not useful unless we use it to you know, increase production or, or um, improve our economics and so on. So, so uh, we need to look at the data from the larger point of view in which we have to work together with all the drillers and all the production engineers, sur surface uh, engineers and so on. So it's really a very collaborative effort that we have to do it right because we don't have time to wait just like, you know, to grow like the oil is. Yeah, Thank you. We had a, a number of questions come in from the audience kind of touching on things that we've, we've already addressed and, and maybe for everybody, I'll just put out there, you know, there's a question about which tasks are really most appropriate in, in geothermal for machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, we touched on a few things, maybe for folks to think about there. Um, and other folks are curious about what are the key challenges in quantifying geothermal resource compared to, for example, hydrocarbon resource. And are we, you know, I think this builds on Isabel's comment as well around risk and, and ways to de-risk um, and earlier comments that you made Sylvia around how some of the technologies we see now may be doing that at low cost. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave those out there if folks want to comment. Maybe on machine learning in particular, that's certainly a hot topic. And can you touch oh, on already I'll, ju I'll jump in. Uh, I did spend about a year in a uh, an AI startup, so I know just enough to be really dangerous in this topic. Uh, but again, what you know, these those types or that technique is most applicable when you have large data sets that and in in dimensions that you can correlate uh, across things. And again, things like uh, the bottom hole temperatures, the thermal conductivities, at least in my domain are ripe for that. There are immense amounts of data out there. And it's currently just a lot of meat servo work uh, to analyze that. So I think that's, it's starting to, you're seeing a lot of funding flow into that area. We've got projects starting up in that area too. But one thing I don't want people to overlook is the anchor data. And it's a rather expensive aspect, but one thing that really is important to the calibrations, whether it's a machine learning tool or even a simple uh, bottom hole correction algorithm, is a few high quality temperature logs or temperature pressure logs are most common. They don't need a lot, but of course they're fairly expensive to get. You need an equilibrated uh, well that's been static for a long time. So it's not high on most people's list and uh, whether you're building a budget or just prioritizing. So kind of a shotgun answer uh, to your question. I'll, I'll uh, yield the floor now. Oh, that's great. It's calibration. Uh, can, I, can I jump, Mike? Oh, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so, 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 so I, I fully agree with Jan, um, but, but I would like to say that, you know, when we talk about data science, analytics, artificial intelligence or that, um, you know, they are just tools. So uh, they are still highly, greatly misunderstood. Even in the oil and gas industry, we have our challenges, you know, to, to show the value. Um, but, but, but so if you want to think fundamentally about them, they are really just mathematical and numerical models. Um, the key is the quality of data and what kind of data 
data type we are getting, we are acquiring. And so from my point of view, because again, I spend so much time looking into this, I think the, 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 the key is what data we are getting, how much data, the quality of data. And so everything goes around what sensors we have available, what technologies we have available to acquire the data. And, and so um, at that point, um, as I said earlier, you know, you know, when we started with telemetry, downhole telemetry for oil and gas applications, many operators questioned actually the cost for installing downhole sensors and optical fibers and so on. So it's a learning curve and we need to prove actually that we know how to acquire data, what kind of data we need, and we are not wasting actually, you know, a lot of sensors for acquiring data that we don't need. Um, and so, and so, to me, actually, the key is the data acquisition. Okay. Are there areas of, of active research? You know, you touched on a few of them, Sylvia, but maybe for everybody, areas of active active research in the oil and gas industry that you've seen successful applications recently to geothermal. And um, it, it's, I put this to everybody. It, it may not be something that that we've we've talked about. Um. So, so I do know that, you know, the geothermal industry being a little bit smaller now than, than the oil and gas industries, they do look at, you know, the cost of installing downhole telemetry. So assuming that they have the sensors that are, you know, um, higher temperature than what is required for oil and gas, um, it's, it's, it's hard to justify for the operations to install, you know, an optical fiber in a well, right? And, and so different startups actually are looking now at, at, at doing that. And so it's a work in progress. I'm, I'm very happy with the direction we are going to, but um, I'm, I'm not aware that you know optical fibers are um, routinely installed in geothermal wells. Mm. Maybe a different kind of question. So we've been talking about data access and, and one of the questions from the audience was related to how we approach national oil companies or really national governments um, if in partnership environments. And that's, it's maybe open to a lot of debate right now as, as we're seeing a burgeoning of this field uh, globally. Yeah, I, I think if I can jump in, I think one of the one of the key is, and you were, I think that, um, I don't know if it's kind of silly that, that mentioned that, um, one of the key is to get some neutral organizations or organizations, geothermal organizations um, that like, you know, IGA or New Zealand or what is inside of the IGA, um, to actually start this conversation with big companies um, because there is in, in a protected, basically safe trust area um, without to start those conversation. Um, I, because it's, it is, it, as you said, it is a fundamental that we have more shared data, even like, you know, on a regional, regional scale, not even just like multi-global, that's never, probably never gonna happen, but even in the countryside, you, you can have some side 10 kilometer aside and they, you don't share data. So it's quite, um, it's really important. Um, one of the thing is that to look as well, some of the, there is different legislation in different country around data and, um, and data access. So I think as well, if, if you want to think globally, um, text model of where, where, where has been the most successful um, you know, innovation. I mean, Europe has been pushing a lot in that sense. Um, so um, that that's model to to follow in terms of collaboration. But I think that needs to be led by neutral um, association that do not have a commercial. They are working for you know developing geothermal, but do not have a specific commercial incentive. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Sorry, go ahead, Ellie. So, so I, I think um, countries, individual governments and NOCs are, you know, already pursuing that, that track um, themselves to evaluate the geothermal potential in their own, own countries, their own areas. Um, there, there is a huge amount of data available, publicly available. It, it's, um, you know, in different formats and not always easy to find and has to be QC'd and collated. So it is definitely not an easy task. But there, there, there is quite a lot out there already. And, and going back to Isabel's comment about how, how we do this on kind of a, a bigger scale, a almost global scale, 
it, it's going to be really challenging because data is, is, is a currency, right? I mean, it's, and, and we protect it. Um, countries, companies protect it. So I think, I think it's a really good idea. And I think it's what we need in a way to really accelerate geothermal on a global scale. But it's going to be very challenging from, from the kind of conversations that we've had to do that. All right. We're getting questions around the expense of the data as well, and whether whether that's changing or, or just to kind of think as an industry, for a geothermal industry perspective, how much money we're talking about this costing a lot of the, the data sets to acquire, to process. I mean, is it on the scale of the, the oil and gas industry? I, I, I see uh, discussions around seismic and, you know, that's pretty expensive stuff. Yeah, and that's where some of the challenge is, right? We have a completely different price point in geothermal from oil and gas. So how do we overcome that? Um, you know, one of the ways in industry is, is multi-client by sharing all different kinds of data sets. And that's what I'm most familiar with. But yeah, how, how do we, on a, on a non-commercial basis, how can we do that when the data has the data's been collected and, and has been very expensive generally to acquire. It, it's, it's going to be a big challenge going forward. Yeah. If we go back to kind of the research side, um, you know, are there things that folks have done in, in recent years in the lab that are helping to, to test some of our base assumptions around geothermal, um, in particular things that may be uh, useful to calibrate or train um, you know, machine learning? That's a question from the audience. Um, and, and I guess it's related to more than anything, uh, what parameters could be trained in the lab? If there's things that come to mind for folks. I mean, obviously for, for, for what, what that's, that's touching particularly the group I'm working with, which is autotermal geochemistry, um, where we are simulating experimentally some of the reaction. It's quite important to calibrate your um, particularly in terms of injectability, so to calibrate your reservoir you're going to get um, and to better understand what will be the reservoir, you, like all the reservoir you're going to get, but also the injectability, the potential for um, injection of non-combustible gas or things like that. So I think there's a, there is a, and, and utilizing both data in terms of modeling, but both are already when you have you already have a target. You already have an area. I think there's also, what, what do you do when you don't have that? Um, and there's probably a lot, there, there is a probably a lot of data that are available you know, in oil and gas, like we were, everyone is mentioning, there's a lot of data out there, but what do you do when you don't have the data where you have the site that is utilized? And I think that's where um, we need to refine um, some of our model about that, that that's what the deep, you know, basically the, what is the temperature of the price at you know, one, two kilometer. Um, and that, that is something that is, yes, there is a lot of data. Yes, there is a lot in, in particularly in oil and gas, um, but those are not necessarily where you're gonna find your best potential. Um, so I think there is also a, a try to, to utilize those data in a mindset that is, well, those are the data available right now. Uh, what do I need? So that will also target your next exploration. Therefore, in research, that's where you're gathering um, some research. But it needs to be low cost and it needs to be quite fast. So I'm not sure that's a big challenge as well. I'm not sure how we're going to do that. Um, but I mean, that for, for us, it's been like, I mean, for example, if you're taking a small country like we have, in, like, you know, in New Zealand, it's very obvious that we have an oil in, we, we have oil and gas field where you have like you have heat and depth, there's no question. However, our best target was definitely not for the development of geothermal in the last 60 years, was not where you have the oil and gas. So, and even in the now, you know, it's even the oil and gas field, are they that's still a low, it's still a medium temperature, it's still not a big, you know, something that is in, like a game changer in terms of electricity generation, for example. So we, we need to be a little bit more mindset, I think, in the way we, we, we're gathering all those data. And I think it's where research, some of the research will, will be very, very important in refining some of the crystal temperature model um, 
to, to better target those and acquire then some, some precise regional data. Yeah, cool. I know your work in volcanology in particular has really worked to better characterize that at a kind of even reservoir scale level, which I find as an oil and gas geologist pretty fascinating, the overlap there. Mm -hmm. I had if a I can, uh, Oh yeah, go ahead, Ken. If I can follow in on what Isabel said, uh, a good case example of that refinement uh, was done uh, last year here under our Project GEO, uh, working with the team at SMU, Joe Petir and Maria Richards, where they incorporated uh, a better radiogenic heat production model for the upper crust uh, to the basement and did a deep dive on three sample counties across Texas on what that does to the temperature depth picture. And it was a fairly significant increase in the temperatures at depth, enough to make a, a significant economic difference if you're looking at putting together a project in that regard. So uh, that's just, I think, an example of what you can do, essentially data mining. The data is already there. It's just reinterpreting and applying a new model to it that made a, a, a fairly hefty difference. Cool. You know, I wanted to start a question maybe that uh, you all can reflect on, and, and I'll start with you, Ken. It's, it's around what you find to be kind of most exciting right now in geothermal um, and maybe in, in the domain of data in general, but what keeps you up at night about the potential in this in this burgeoning field? Um, and I know, Ken, you've even looked extraterrestrially at some of these data sets. Ooh, that's a broad set of things. Uh, let's see. What keeps me up at night uh, again, it goes back to there's a lot of people jumping in the field, and especially engineer background, uh, that may not under, appreciate the, the pitfalls on the earth science side or even the value of it. Um, one thing I'd like to stress, and the engineering is, frankly, what's driving this reemergence or renaissance in, in geothermal, and it is, I find it very exciting, too. But just as understanding the soil underneath the foundation of your house is critical, so is understanding the geoscience that you're going to. It's not just a matter of, oh, let's just drill here. We'll drill deep enough and we'll hit the temperature. Well, yes, if you've got unlimited money, resources, and time, but understanding and refining the geoscience or the, uh, the earth picture is a matter of buying down risk and uh, reducing the uncertainty. And that matters to everybody in the whole chain of, of develop, developing a project. Uh, I'm already forgetting a couple of the intermediate questions, but one oh, other- sure. one other, terrestrial. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the one that stuck in my head because it, it's yeah. uh, pretty offbeat and far out. But frankly, uh, you know, we're getting close to seeing uh, humans and uh, more advanced robotic systems going outside the earth in the solar system. Mars is an obvious near topic that might have humans on it fairly soon, and we're going to need energy there. The problem is, as you go out in the solar system from Earth, solar power drops off as the one over the square, and uh, radioactive power sources, which have been our source for deep probes, have their own problems, which are pretty obvious to everybody. But uh, there's possible geothermal uh, power to be exploited in the outer solar system. Mars is iffy, but may have some. As you go farther out, the icy moons, as I'm starting to look at, uh, have strong potential where you have a 200 degree C gradient between subsurface oceans and the surface temperature. Okay, that's something you can work with. And so as we go farther out, I think it's time to start looking even at that. Those are long lead term, lead time, major engineering projects that aren't gonna happen overnight though research to, to, to drive some innovation. Yeah. I, I guess I was thinking also remote, remote sensing is really in a renaissance now as well and higher resolution than ever. Um, yes. And we're, we're seeing particularly things like uh, INSAR and other and satellite based radar being very uh, useful, particularly in active systems in conventional systems and active producing systems at uh, measuring changes or, you know, looking for where the tectonic activity might uh, open up fractures and such. Um, I'd be curious to know what the industry folks and others think on this. Anybody else? I know, I know you all are excited people about a lot of different things. 
So it's, it's it. hard. It's hard to follow Ken, right, with extraterrestrial. Uh, so back back down to Earth. I guess I guess my one um, on the client side would be I'm amazed and excited at, at the different types of clients that are coming to to talk to us about geothermal. You know, clients a year ago that I never would have thought would be interested or thinking about how it fits in with their strategy. It's, <clears throat> always focused on oil and gas and now they're seriously looking at geothermal and and how they can how they can build that into their portfolio so to me it's you know we need we need the commercial the in industry interest in it to really get it moving at a fast pace i think you touched on something here like it's like we need to be faster there's no no question about it um like fast yeah because i mean that's that is one of the exciting thing about being in geothermal right now is seeing the enthusiasm um that is coming in and seeing some of the innovation and development that is happening um it's it's fantastic and i think there's you know it's the, the geothermal industry is just a wide range as well of techniques and um, and, and even like energy source, right? We're not looking at just one product. So it's, it's multi-client, multi-product, um, and vitrification of the heat, not only, you know, it's not just generation, it's vitrification of the heat as well. So it's, it's really challenging, but we, we really need to find some um, to, to a more like globalized approach and a more, um, as we as we mentioned before, you know, like a like a sharing data and and having a, a, a common innovation because we 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 are just not fast enough right now to 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 transition to help the transition. So, um, that that would be my take on. But what a great time to to be to be in at that people told oh what a pun. <laughs> Not intended, uh, but at the, it's really a pivotal times, really, for, for geothermal. You know, geothermal has been, a, it's an old industry that's been here for a long time. And seeing now um, so much interest into it, that's bringing so much opportunity um, for, for, for development and innovation and, and maybe new, a new, geo, like a new geothermal, you know, um, like almost a tool like a something so, the, so so yeah i mean for me that's what's keep me it's like it's you know being part of this change and and being part of um yeah this innovation it's it's quite exciting time may i please um e e excellent comments I, I i would just say you don't know what you don't know um so you know i i guess everybody nowadays in the oil and gas industry is really excited about geothermal i can hear it everywhere i i receive a lot of messages in my inbox every day about geothermal now um so so i think everybody agrees the potential is huge right now the problem is way too complex uh, to have only one solution and 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 so you know in terms of topics being production you know subsurface characterization facilities sur surface facilities all these are really great topics that need new solutions and need somehow to be you know together in a geothermal project However, uh, the type of project is not unique uh, it depends on, you know, around the world, we are talking even electricity versus power, uh, this is um, uh, thermal. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 really, it's really hard to come up with only one solution. So what, what I truly believe is how we can accelerate innovation and how we can collaborate all together to use all our expertise diversify expertise actually even if we fail we learn from our failures but we need to progress faster and so that's actually the key there is not one solution for geothermal but we have to work together to find our ways into how to develop geothermal resources you know from the oil and gas industry perspective I, I i'm really interested in the areas of specific overlap and i think we've all identified several you know in the drilling realm in the low, low and high temperature reservoir realm, in areas related to, you know, for instance, for instance, log data that we've talked about, 
Um, and I guess the question I would have too is, if those, you know, are there things, other areas that you guys see where we've already been seeing really useful overlap, um, really useful progress, collaboration? And, and I, I, I focus on oil and gas in particular because I, I know that really the, it's also a very old industry that's had a long-term profit model test of what it's doing. And innovation in it really has been driven by the need to produce more effectively, for example, in the Permian. Um, you know, I'm really interested in other areas in this conference, for example, where they're exploring the, the possible applications of that type of technological approach, for example, and, and how, you know, are we, we can, how can we work smarter and not harder, as it were? Um, and I, so I guess a question you know, for folks who, who touch on the industry a little bit is, is, are you seeing, you know, new areas where this is, this is collaborative work that's coming or areas where you would hope to see it? I think it's slightly, not, not totally directly answering your question there, Mike, but um, I think the, the new entries into the industry, so our new graduates are bringing in a huge number of new ideas and new skill sets and the geoscientists, they're all data scientists as well. You know, it's, it's tough to um, keep up with the pace that they have and, and they're looking at things in a very different way. So I think going forward, you know, it's going to be really exciting to watch that new generation and, and how they bring what they've learned from university and from the early uh, years in their uh, oil and gas career into geothermal and into the energy transition as a whole. That's a great point. Yeah, because people are our biggest resource, really. Yeah. One area that is crossing over but will need even more intense work, and it's kind of uh, an elephant in the room is the seismicity issues. Uh, we here also run the uh, seismic monitoring system for Texas and have developed quite a close partnership agreement with both regulators and industry on real-time monitoring of, of induced seismicity, tracking its trends, reacting to it and such. And you know, as the new geothermal paradigm anywhere will be placing drilling in and around cities to, the, to a large degree, as well as the already established direct use, particularly uh, in Europe and other parts where it's been a critical issue. Uh, porting over all that knowledge and developing new uh, is critical. And, and you know, a very tough problem is characterizing the potential for seismicity in advance. Uh, and so that's another one of those data areas where it's gonna be in everybody's interest to pool knowledge and pool resources so that that doesn't become a showstopper uh, to developing this, this field. It's a very good point, yeah. Well, we're, we're working on, um... On, on discussing in, in great detail all of these these risk elements, I guess one thing, Ken, I wonder is, are there government data sets that we would be building off anyway? And I know that in industry, that's that's a typical approach uh, to begin to look for. You know, for example, for for earthquake seismicity, um, and maybe that's an area where where industry could see their own data sets. You know, being willing to share. I don't know. That's a question. I don't know that I have. A broad answer to that. There, there, you know, obviously here in the U.S., the U.S. Geologic Survey is the collector of that, and our our system here in Texas feeds into that. As there are multiple projects brewing regionally, uh, we are designing the monitoring systems for those, and uh, you know that that kind of data will be public. It's part of a our mission of the Bureau, I didn't say at the beginning, is also the State Geologic Survey for Texas. So uh, pretty much by definition, uh, unless there's some reason otherwise, that data will become public. And I think largely those that type of data anyway is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's the same in New, I mean, in New Zealand, obviously, which is a very active country. I mean, we have a different, um, I will say, I don't know if I could say that, sensitivity around seismic and because we always feel some little earthquake. Um, so 
that's quite people are quite used to it to be honest um the um that doesn't mean that it's not important um we, we, there is yes there is the national so you know gns we we are collecting obviously all the in cataloging all the earthquake and monitoring and so if you have some some earthquake happening in geothermal system there is also part of the knowledge that is like in the company that it's private private um uh, but, but, but there is a big difference between those big data collection. I think we don't have some people looking at it as well in terms of for the geothermal specific because they are so important for just hazard analysis that they are not necessarily, there's, there's very few people that use, I mean, you can use all of this data, but the network for hazard monitoring and the network for um, um, seismic sensitivity, incidence, all of this factor that are, could be associated with geothermal is not necessarily the same. So it's really um, important, I think, to merge as well as the, just the scientists in those two systems. Um, because, it, yeah, there is, um, there is this little bit of realignment between the data sets that are gathered nationally for hazard monitoring and some of the data set that needs to be associated with um, geothermal. Um, risk utilization. Mm. Now, thanks for that fascinating example. It, it's 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 certainly an area you've, you've seen a lot of detail on. I'm going to try to make sure we ask a couple of audience questions, um, and they may not be for everybody. But one question is: How much of the oil and gas subsurface modeling workflow can be directly applied to the geothermal industry? And I think Elliot, you touched on this a little bit in terms of the people and what they're working. Um, I guess subsurface modeling workflow is a broad term, uh, but we touched on that a little bit. Yeah, so so there are um, a lot of similarities be between the two. I, th I think uh, obviously the main difference is, is temperature is key, temperature and, and flow rates. Um, so so you can use similar softwares, but um, you have to make, make some um, adjustments to those. And, and there's a lot of different factors that you have to bring in. I think one of the main differences when we look at uh, geothermal models is our use of multi-physics um, data. That's, that's not something that's typically used in oil and gas to the same extent. But I think one of the, the things that, that's really struck me um, is, is the amount of transferable skills. I, I know there's a lot of people out there with a very strong oil and ba gas background who are trying to transfer over into geothermal. And, and there really are a, a lot of the fundamentals that, that we learn in the oil and gas industry can be applied to geothermal. Okay. Well, folks, we're at five minutes or so left. Um, I hate to cut us short, but I, I wanted to leave some time for folks to, to reflect and uh, make a closing remark or two if you wanted. Um, and I was gonna go in the reverse order that I did earlier and maybe start with you, Sylvia. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, really great panel. I, I, I enjoy it. Um, so um, as closing remarks, I would like to say I'm, that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer in data and collaboration. And, and geothermal has huge potential for, for scaling up. Um, and I believe that data science and analytics uh, and close-up collaborations among all of us uh, are critical for making geothermal work everywhere faster. Um, so the, the geothermal community needs uh, to unite uh, in order to be more competitive to other renewable um, technologies such as uh, uh, solar and, and wind. I think we need, we need to reflect on that a little bit more. But yes, I do believe the geothermal community needs to unite. Um, and, so, and so the time to act is now. Cool. All right. How about you, Ken? Yes, thanks, Mike. Uh, this is the most exciting time by far in geothermal that I've seen since I started in the 90s. Uh, and it's just tremendous. The, the synergy that's coming from blending the oil and gas world with the geothermal world is tremendous. And we're going to see more from that. So I'm looking forward to more people getting into this area and bringing some fresh perspectives and fresh ideas. And a key thing that we haven't mentioned is the ability to learn the 101s. I saw a course just recently, I don't remember who was sponsoring that one, 
on essentially geothermal 101. The AEPG is doing one in September for one day that gives folks in the, in, in the oil and gas industry a more basic grounding as well as actually venture capital world and uh, government regulatory world, uh, a starting point to dive deeper in this area. But uh, very exciting time and thanks for letting me be a part of this. Appreciate it. How about you, Ellie? Well, thanks, uh, my fellow panelists. I really enjoyed the discussion. Um, I think for me, I'm, I'm optimistic because the, the number of people that we've spoken to over the last year who, who didn't weren't thinking about geothermal before, who didn't have it on their radar, who were very firmly in the oil and gas camp, you know, now they're thinking about geothermal in a whole new way. And, and they want to evaluate their acreage, their areas of geographic interest for geothermal potential. And they're thinking about the end use. You know, they're not, it's not just power anymore. It's how, how do we, how do we assess the local markets? How, how do we um, fit geothermal into our overall opportunities? And, and to me, that's, that's really exciting because it's, it's the, the operators out there that need to make this change that, need to drive this forward. So I will be watching Pivot with a lot of excitement this week, and I'll be looking for ways to collaborate with, uh, with um, people throughout the conference. So thanks very much. Great, Isabel? Uh, yeah, quickly, um, thank you very much. Yes, indeed, that was a very um, interesting discussion. Thank you very much for the invite. And um, as you said, it's such, such an opportunity right now and such a, uh, a, a, a game changer, really. And I, I just wanted to reiterate what Sylvia said about the fact that the geothermal community needs to unite. Um, it's not only re reunite, I think it needs to be reborn as well. So um, yeah, charge. Great. I'm really, really excited to see what we all do next and what we do next as a community. And thank you so much for all your input panel. And it's amazing to talk to you and amazing to meet you. And uh, let's go have a great conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.